Hi everybody, Ian Bremer here, and a quick take to kick off your week, and a challenging week indeed for President Zelensky, um, as we start to see um, more pushback on the ability to continue uh, to support uh, the Ukrainians in defending themselves against the ongoing Russian invasion. Uh, a few different stories here. Uh, the most meaningful one uh, being uh, the push against Speaker of the House Kevin McCarthy, um, particularly around support for Ukraine aid. And if McCarthy goes down, uh, that is a big uh, hit to the ability to get additional Ukrainian aid uh, approved um, over the coming months. Um, if you know any further, any future speaker um, that sees that the conservatives of the GOP were prepared to take out Kevin McCarthy uh, for willingness um, to work with the Democrats and get Ukrainian funding done separately uh, would certainly mean uh, that his replacement uh, is going to be very hard pressed to put forward legislation uh, that would continue to fund them. So this has become a big political football in the United States. Uh, Republicans, uh, now identified Republicans, a majority say that too much aid is going from the United States. Ukraine should be significantly reduced, if not cut off entirely. Uh, Democrats, those numbers are also going up, but they're still in the minority, about 30% in independence, more like 40 to 50. But that's very, very different from where aid to Ukraine was three months ago, six months ago, 12 months ago, not aligned uh, with President Biden, not aligned with what had been a bipartisan consensus. And while there's a lot of economic aid that goes from Ukraine, uh, from Europe to Ukraine, the military support comes overwhelmingly from the United States. So this is a very serious problem. Uh, makes it very hard to imagine that Ukraine would be able to um, engage in a second counteroffensive next year. Um, and of course, that means that the land that they presently occupy is the land that they look to be occupying for at least the near term uh, foreseeable future. Um, that's, that's one point. Secondly, uh, Canada, which has been one of the strongest supporters of Ukraine with a, a large uh, Ukrainian uh, population, ethnic Ukrainian population that's, that's politically very salient um, in Canada. Uh, they had their Speaker of the Canadian Parliament forced to resign uh, after introducing and celebrating um, a, a man as a war hero that had fought with a Nazi unit in World War II. It is very clear that the speaker had no idea that that was his background. He comes from Northern Ontario. He knows nothing about foreign policy, uh, but hugely embarrassing uh, for the Trudeau government uh, and for um, a, a government that has been, again, very, very outspoken um, in uh, what they're willing to provide for the Ukrainians. And if you oppose that, uh, you now have a lot of uh, grist for your mill. And then finally, uh, Robert Fico, uh, Fico uh, the um, uh, former uh, PM um, of Slovakia, uh, had been forced out uh, for corruption, uh, just had an election, parliamentary election. His party uh, came in front. They will form a coalition in the coming weeks. Um, he ran on a left-wing Slovak populist platform, but also on a strongly pro-Russian platform, uh, and has said that there will be no more military aid coming from Slovakia to Ukraine. Now, that doesn't actually matter. They don't provide very much that they did. That matter was just at the beginning. Um, and, uh, and also, it's not going to prevent the, uh, the, the EU from ongoing economic support. The Slovaks will be bought off, especially in coalition. But, but these, are, these are significant uh, pieces in showing a level of fatigue uh, for supporting the ongoing Ukraine war. It is a meaningful effort. It is tens and tens of billions of dollars in euros um, and no end to the war in sight. So increasingly, you're seeing voices saying, well, how might one go about 
negotiation. And of course, uh, most publicly, uh, the wealthiest man in the world, Elon Musk, um, who just over the last couple of days was posting pro-Kremlin propaganda uh, going after Zelensky. An enormous turnaround for a man who had done among the most of anyone to support the Ukrainians in providing um, his own Starlink system um, ostensibly just for humanitarian purposes, but he knew very well it was being used and supported it being used to help defend the Ukrainians from invasion made a big difference. He's not there now. Now he's saying this war needs to end, the aid needs to end, and has been supporting um, and promoting a lot of pro-Russian and anti-Ukrainian accounts. So you put all of that together, uh, I do think that this is a much more challenging set of headwinds uh, for Zelensky and for the Ukrainian people trying um, to defend themselves. Now, what does that all mean? Well, it's not going to affect the EU accession process, which continues to move um, and will provide a lot of economic support and promote a lot of economic reform uh, in Ukraine, which is necessary. Um, And the Russians are not going to be able to suddenly uh, turn on their own offensive because they don't have the troops available. Um, They haven't yet um, put forward a new mobilization. And Putin's unlikely to do that um, until after his own internal um, parliamentary elections um, in the coming year. Um, And and once you do that, um, you still need to train them. So I would say we're probably a minimum of a year before the Russians would be able to make significant additional gains against Ukraine in the worst case scenario for the Ukrainians. Also, the Ukrainians have had some successes, not in terms of taking territory, but in their ability to target the Black Sea Fleet. Um, in their ability to engage in successful drone strikes against Crimea, occupied by Russia, as well as against Russian territory, the Russian homeland itself. Uh, They've also been able um, to get their own ships out into the Black Sea, which means more food and fertilizer coming from Ukraine, even though that deal that had been brokered by the UN and Turkey has fallen apart. So, I mean, these are not end times for the Ukrainians, by any means, uh, but it is very hard to see anything that looks like what the Ukrainians would describe as a victory, meaning at the minimum pushing the Russians out of all the territory that they have taken of Ukraine since February 24th. And I'm not even thinking about things like war reparations um, and the rest. And and in in that regard, um, you know the the need. Um, for the Americans and NATO to sit down with the Ukrainian government and try to figure out how one might over time get to a ceasefire. What can be provided um, to the Ukrainians that would allow them to and accept a reality where all of their land is not coming back to them? A, a, politically, that's almost inconceivable right now. I, I can't see any Ukrainian leader that would be able to sell that to his own population. Maybe the exception is if there was full NATO accession as a member that ensured that the West would actually defend non-occupied Ukraine from further assault. But the Americans are not there right now. um, And that gets harder to promote the closer we get to the upcoming elections. There's also risks in that, of course, because it means, yes, indeed, the West would actually be defending Ukraine from further Russian strikes. So this is looking increasingly difficult uh, in terms of endgame and more problematic uh, for the Biden administration and the coherence of NATO. Um, that's, that is the analysis as I see it. Um, and uh, we'll keep following this very closely, of course. I hope everyone's doing well, and I'll talk to you all real soon. 